Okay, good morning class. This is accelerated and it's lit speed building today from 150 to 180, okay? So um, let me give you some words on your speed building. You have David Powell, DBA Powell Insurance Agency. You have insurance, Harleyville, Harleysville Mutual Insurance Company. Terminate contract. You have violation. Automobile Reparation Reform Act, Virginia Code. You have statute, a little tough. You have unprofitability, insurance. You have substantial, thereafter, contract. You have, as a result, Commissioner violation, revocation, okay? And real quickly, y'all, if you notice in Blackboard when you log in for uh, week one, at the very top, there's a discussion form. So participate in that because next semester it's going to be part of your grade. So make sure that you participate in it. That way you know how to work it, how you know, you know how to respond to a student's comments, how to reply. And um, it just gives you more of a feeling of being involved in the classroom. I did see most of you have accessed it, but a lot, but some of you haven't. So please be sure to access your discussion forum. It's up there for a week, and the next week it'll change topics. Okay? And it's just for you all to give each other feedback, give me feedback. Like maybe the tests are too hard. Anything you all, it's just a form of communication, and it gives us more of a of a classroom setting. Okay? So let me see, let me give you um, 150 for five minutes speed building, okay? Lift to top. This is an action for a permanent injunction by David Powell, DBA Powell Insurance Agency, an insurance agency writing insurance for Harleysville Mutual Insurance Company. Harleysville has attempted to terminate the agency as provided in the agency's contract. Powell contends that termination is being sought as the result of the volume of automobile insurance written and that termination would be in violation of the Automobile Reparation Reform Act, Virginia Code, Section 38-37-940, 1976 Code of Laws. Harleysville urges that termination became necessary due to the coalescence of a number of deficiencies by the Powell Agency and the agency's failure to meet Harleysville's overall objective. Two primary issues are raised. First, did Harleysville attempt to terminate the Powell agency due to the volume of automobile business written by Powell so as to be in violation of the Virginia Code? Second, if the termination of the Powell agency would constitute a violation of the reference statute, does the statute confer upon Powell a private cause of action which would justify injunction relief? Since the statute provides a Stated remedy for any violation, subsidiary issues are raised and might be conveniently denominated as follows. Is the statutory remedy exclusive? Is any private cause of action created? And if so, is the Powell agency within the class of persons for whose benefit the act is intended? And would the creation of a private cause of action by statute in this case contravene constitutional protections against impairment of contract, due process, and other related constitutional provisions? The parties entered into an agency contract on October 25, 1973. Section 18 of the contract provided that it could be terminated by each of the parties without cause upon not less than 60 days written notice given the other party. David Powell was notified by letter dated March 3, 1976 that the agency would be terminated effective June 1, 1976. Thereafter, Powell secured a temporary injunction of this court dated May 19, 1976. Since that time, the parties have continued to operate under the contract for force of the temporary injunction. A hearing was held before me on Thursday, December 15, 1977, in which testimony was taken to determine factually whether the attempted termination was in violation of the statute. I find that the primary reason for termination of the contract was the unprofitability of the automobile business written by the Powell Agency. Specifically, I find the following facts. A contract between the parties predates the Automobile Reparation Reform Act and provides that either party may terminate upon 60 days written notice. 
When the contract was entered into, Powell represented that he would develop commercial insurance business and that he would upgrade the automobile business. Prior to entering into the contract with Harleysville, most of Powell's business was assigned risk business. Powell has not developed any substantial commercial insurance business. Each of the assigned risk carriers for whom Powell wrote business has terminated its relationship with Powell. Accordingly, Harleysville is being saddled with substandard and sorry, unprofitable formally assigned risk business. As a result of the Automobile Reparation Reform Act, Powell and Harleysville cannot refuse this business. Hence, Harleysville losses from the Powell Agency's business have been enormous and there is no chance of Harleysville making any profit in the future. Its losses will continue because the business being written by Powell is unprofitable. The act provided that a carrier cannot terminate an agency due to the volume of automobile insurance written and that if it does cancel in violation of the act, such violation shall result in the suspension or revocation of the insurer's certificate of authority for not less than six months. Various arguments have been advanced by the defendant to the effect that the remedy provided is exclusive and that the insurance commissioner is the only person who can enforce the act. Additionally, several rules of statutory construction have been urged upon me so as to defeat the plaintiff's prayer for relief. While I recognize that my brethren on the state and federal bench have issued orders supportive of the defendant's position, I am inclined to view that in a proper case an agency may have standing to assert its action under the statute. Contra e.g. the Camden Insurance Real Estate Agency, Inc. versus the Hartford Accident and Indemnity Company Civil Action Number 76 dash. And this is hard, you all. So let's see some words, um, arguments. Let me write some of these down for you. Is A-R-G-T-S, arguments, A-R-G-T-S. Without the Z, oh. A-R-G-T-S, no U, okay? Commissioner is commissioner, two strokes. You have reparation. I think it's just reparation, yes. You have violation is V-Long I-L-G-S, violation. You have contract, K-R-R-T. KR final T, so KR final T, contract. You have contravene, contravene, three strokes. And then you have constitutional, institutional. Sorry, I have nails and I need to get rid of them. <laughs> constitutional. And then you have thereafter is one stroke. THR, FR, thereafter with an A, sorry. THR, AFR. Okay. This is going to be 160, you all, and it is tough for five minutes. This is an action for a permanent injunction by David Powell, DBA, Powell Insurance Agency, an insurance agency writing insurance for Harleysville Mutual Insurance Company. Harleysville has attempted to terminate the agency as provided in the agency's contract. Powell contends that termination is being sought as a result of the volume of automobile insurance written and that termination would be in violation of the Automobile Reparation Reform Act, Virginia Code Section 38-37-940, 1976 Code of Laws. Harleysville urges that termination became necessary due to the coalescence of a number of deficiencies by the Powell Agency and the agency's failure to meet Harleysville's overall objective. Two primary issues are raised. First, did Harleysville attempt to terminate the Powell Agency due to the volume of automobile business written by Powell, so as to be in violation of the Virginia Code? Second, if the termination of the Powell Agency would constitute a violation of the reference statute, does the statute confer upon Powell a private cause of action which would justify injunction relief. Since the statute provides a stated remedy for any violation, subsidiary issues are raised and might be conveniently denominated as follows. Is the statutory remedy exclusive? Is any private cause of action created? And if so, 
is the Powell agency within the class of persons for whose benefit the act is intended? And would the creation of a private cause of action by statute in this case contravene constitutional protections against impairment of contract due process and other related constitutional provisions? The parties entered into an agency contract on October 25, 1973. Section 18 of the contract provided that it could be terminated by each of the parties without cause upon not less than 60 days written notice given the other party. David Powell was notified by letter dated March 3, 1976 that the agency would be terminated effective June 1, 1976. Thereafter, Powell secured a temporary injunction of this court dated May 19, 1976. Since that time, the parties have continued to operate under the contract per force of the temporary injunction. A hearing was held before me on Thursday, December 15, 1977, in which testimony was taken to determine factually whether the attempted termination was in violation of the statute. I find that the primary reason for termination of the contract was the unprofitability of the automobile business written by the Powell Agency. Specifically, I find the following facts. A contract between the parties predates the Automobile Reparation Reform Act and provides that either party may terminate upon 60 days written notice. When the contract was entered into, Powell represented that he would develop commercial insurance business and that he would upgrade the automobile business prior to entering into the contract with Harleysville. Most of Powell's business was assigned risk business. Powell has not developed any substantial commercial insurance business. Each of the assigned risk carriers for whom Powell wrote business has terminated its relationship with Powell. Accordingly, Harleysville is being saddled with substandard, unprofitable, formally assigned risk business. As a result of the Automobile Reparation Reform Act, Powell and Harleysville cannot refuse this business. Hence, the Harleysville's losses from the Powell Agency's business have been enormous and there is no chance of Harleysville making any profit in the future. Its losses will continue because the business being written by Powell is unprofitable. The act provided that a carrier cannot terminate an agency due to the volume of automobile insurance written and that if it does cancel in violation of the act, such violations shall result in the suspension or revocation of the insurer's certificate of authority for not less than six months. Various arguments have been advanced by the defendant to the effect that the remedy provided is exclusive and that the insurance commissioner is the only person who can enforce the act. Additionally, several rules of statutory construction have been urged upon me so as to defeat the plaintiff's prayer for relief. While I recognize that my brethren on the state and the federal bench have issued orders supportive of the defendant's position, I am inclined to view that in a proper case, an agency may have standing to assert its action under the statute contra e.g. the Camden Insurance Real Estate Agency Inc. versus the Hartford Accident and Indemnity Company, Civil Action Number 76-1363, August 4, 1977, and Roy E. Garris, DBA, Garris Insurance Agency, versus Hanover Insurance Company, Civil Action Number 67-1141, August 3, 1977, decided by the Honorable Robert F. Chapman and George L. Johnson and Son, Inc. versus Grain Dealers Mutual Insurance Company, Civil Action Number 76 dash That's hard. So uh, some words that come out, you have profit is P-R-O-F-T, P-R-O-F-T. Let me just minimize myself. You have, oh, insurance um, reform, I think it's just R-E-F-R-M, R-F-R-M, R final F-R-M for reform, okay? No vowel in that stroke. And then you've got, um, Insurance agency is S-N-U-R-G-S, because insurance agent is S-N-U-R-G-T, so why not do insurance agency G-S? It doesn't come out as anything. Um, you've got insurance company is SNRK, S-N-U-R-K. You have denominated, denominate, come back D. You've got mm, agency by itself is AG, agent, and then SI. You've got substantial is STANL, S-T-A-N-L, and this is going to be at 170, you all. 
this is an action for a permanent injunction by David Powell, DBA, Powell Insurance Agency, an insurance agency writing insurance for Harleysville Mutual Insurance Company. Harleysville has attempted to terminate the agency as provided in the agency's contract. Powell contends that termination is being sought as the result of the volume of automobile insurance written and that termination would be in violation of the Automobile Reparation Reform Act, Virginia Code Section 38-37-940, 1976 Code of Laws. Harleysville urges that termination became necessary due to the coalescence of a number of deficiencies by the Powell Agency and the agency's failure to meet Harleysville's overall objective. Two primary issues are raised. First, did Harleysville attempt to terminate the Powell Agency due to the volume of automobile business written by Powell, so as to be in violation of the Virginia Code. Second, if the termination of the Powell Agency would constitute a violation of the reference statute, does the statute confer upon Powell a private cause of action which would justify injunction relief? Since the statute provides a stated remedy for any violation, subsidiary issues are raised and might be conveniently denominated as follows. Is the statutory remedy exclusive? Is any private cause of action created? And if so, is the Powell Agency within the class of persons for whose benefit the act is intended? And would the creation of a private cause of action by statute in this case contravene constitutional protections against impairment of contract due process and other related constitutional provisions? The parties entered into an agency contract on October 25, 1973. Section 18 of the contract provided that it could be terminated by each of the parties without cause upon not less than 60 days written notice given by the other party. David Powell was notified by letter dated March 3, 1976 that the agency would be terminated effective Jan or June 1, 1976 thereafter. Powell secured a temporary injunction of this court dated May 19, 1976. Since that time, the parties have continued to operate under the contract for force of the temporary injunction. A hearing was held before me on Thursday, December 15, 1977, in which testimony was taken to determine factually whether the attempted termination was in violation of the statute. I find that the primary reason for termination of the contract was the unprofitability of the automobile business written by the Powell Agency. Specifically, I find the following facts. A contract between the parties predates the Automobile Reparation Reform Act and provides that either party may terminate upon 60 days written notice. When the contract was entered into, Powell represented that he would develop commercial insurance business and that he would upgrade the automobile business prior to entering into the contract with Harleysville. Most of Powell's business was assigned risk business. Powell has not developed any substantial commercial insurance business. Each of the assigned risk carriers for whom Powell wrote business has terminated its relationship with Powell. Accordingly, Harleysville is being saddled with substandard, unprofitable, formerly assigned risk business. As a result of the Automobile Reparation Reform Act, Powell and Harleysville cannot refuse this business. Hence, Harleysville losses from the Powell agency's business have been enormous, and there is no chance of Harleysville making any profit in the future. Its losses will continue because the business being written is by Powell and is unprofitable. The act provided that a carrier cannot terminate an agency due to the volume of automobile insurance written and that if it does cancel in violation of the act, such violation shall result in the suspension or revocation of the insurer's certificate of authority for not less than six months. Various arguments have been advanced by the defendant to the effect that the remedy provided is exclusive and that the insurance commissioner is the only person who can enforce the act. Additionally, several rules of statutory construction have been urged upon me so as to defeat the plaintiff's prayer for relief. While I recognize that my brethren on the state and federal bench have issued orders supportive of the defendant's position, I'm inclined to view that in a proper case, an agency may have a standing to assert its action under the statute. Contra e.g. the Camden Insurance Real Estate Agency, Inc. versus the Hartford Accident and Indemnity Company, Civil Action Number 76-1363, August 4, 1977, and Roy E. Garris, DBA, Garris Insurance Agency versus Hanover Insurance Company, Civil Action Number 67-1141, August 3, 1977, decided by the Honorable Robert F. Chapman and George L. Johnson and Son, Inc., 
versus Grain Dealers Mutual Insurance Company, Civil Action Number 76-1720, June 29, 1977, decided by the Honorable Robert W. Hemphill and Van Robinson Insurance Agency, Inc. versus Harleysville Mutual Insurance Company, decided by the Honorable Walter J. Bristow, May 27, 1977. I need not reach any esoteric questions of statutory construction or legislative intent. Application of the statutory prohibition concerning termination due to the amount of automobile insurance written to the defendant in the present case would patently operate as an unconstitutional. That's hard. Since I have time, I'll, I'll go up to 180, okay? Just so you know, it is hard. Let me write some, some more of these words down for you all. Um, we have automobile, A-U-B-L. You have um, insurance, S-N-U-R-N-S, -N -N insurance. You have creation. Let me see, creation. Two strokes. You have Injunction, I N junction, two strokes. You have operate as O E R P T. You have commercial, one stroke, K M E R B L. You have substandard is just sub, and then starred is standard, S T A R D. You have There was a word, oh, coalescence, coal, coalescence, coalescence. Let me see. Hmm. Okay, so I got coal there. That's the coal I want. Coal, le, coal lessons, coal. One more stroke, just a bit of coalescence. I don't know why the ENS is not coming down. Should be ENS at the end, okay? And then you have business is B-I-Z. And one more. Let's try coal. not coming out. Uh, protection is P-R-E-X with an asterisk. Necessary is N-E-S with an, just like that. Oh, cause of action is K-A-U-X. Yes, okay. And this is gonna be 180, you all. Hold on, it's gonna be tough. This is an action for a permanent Injunction by David Powell, DBA Powell Insurance Agency, an insurance agency writing insurance for Harleysville Mutual Insurance Company. Harleysville has attempted to terminate the agency as provided in the agency's contract. Powell contends that termination is being sought as a result of the volume of automobile insurance written and that termination would be in violation of the Automobile Reparation Reform Act, Virginia Code Section 38-37-940-1976, Code of Laws. Harleysville urges that termination became necessary due to the coalescence of a number of deficiencies by the Powell Agency and the agency's failure to meet Harleysville's overall objective. Two primary issues are raised. First, did Harleysville attempt to terminate the Powell agency due to the volume of automobile business written by Powell so as to be in violation of the Virginia Code? Second, if the termination of the Powell agency would constitute a violation of the reference statute 
does the statute confer upon Powell a private cause of action which would justify injunction relief? Since the statute provides a stated remedy for any violation, subsidiary issues are raised and might be conveniently denominated as follows. Is the statutory remedy exclusive? Is any private cause of action created? And if so, is the Powell agency within the class of persons for whose benefit the act is intended? And would the creation of a private cause of action by statute in this case contravene constitutional protections against impairment of contract, due process, and other related constitutional provisions? The parties entered into an agency contract on October 25, 1973. Section 18 of the contract provided that it could be terminated by each of the parties without cause upon not less than 60 days written notice given the other party. David Powell was notified by letter dated March 3, 1976 that the agency would be terminated effective June 1, 1976. Thereafter, Powell secured a temporary injunction of this court dated May 19, 1976. Since that time, the parties have continued to operate under the contract per force of the temporary injunction. A hearing was held before me on Thursday, December 15, 1977, in which testimony was taken to determine factually whether the attempted termination was in violation of the statute. I find that the primary reason for termination of the contract was the unprofitability of the automobile business written by the Powell Agency. Specifically, I find the following facts. A contract between the parties predates the Automobile Reparation Reform Act and provides that either party may terminate upon 60 days written notice. When the contract was entered into, Powell represented that he would develop commercial insurance business and that he would upgrade the automobile business. Prior to entering into the contract with Harleysville, most of Powell's business was assigned risk business. Powell has not developed any substantial commercial insurance business. Each of the assigned risk carriers for whom Powell wrote business has terminated its relationship with Powell. Accordingly, accordingly Harleysville is being saddled with substandard, unprofitable, formally assigned risk business. As a result of the Automobile Reparation Reform Act, Powell and Harleysville cannot refuse this business, hence Harleysville losses from the Powell Agency's business have been enormous and there is no chance of Harleysville making any profit in the future. Its losses will continue because the business being written by Powell is unprofitable. The act provided that a carrier cannot terminate an agency due to the volume of automobile insurance written and that if such does cancel in violation of the act, such violation shall result in the suspension or revocation of the insurer's certificate of authority for not less than six months. Various arguments have been advanced by the defendant to the effect that the remedy provided is exclusive and that the insurance carrier is the only person who can enforce the act. Additionally, several rules of statutory construction have been urged upon me, so as to defeat the plaintiff's prayer for relief. While I recognize that my brethren on the state and federal bench have issued orders supportive of the defendant's position, I am inclined to view that in a proper case, an agency may have standing to assert its action under the statute contra e.g. the Camden Insurance Real Estate Agency, Inc. versus the Hartford Accident and Indemnity Company Civil Action Number 76-1363, August 4, 1977, and Roy E. Garris, DBA, Garris Insurance Agency versus Hanover Insurance Company, Civil Action Number 67-1141, August 3, 1977, decided by the Honorable Robert F. Chapman and George L. Johnson and Son, Inc. versus Grain Dealers Mutual Co Insurance Company, Civil Action Number 76-1720, June 29, 1977, decided by the Honorable Robert W. Hemphill and Van Robinson Insurance Agency, Inc. versus Harleysville Mutual Insurance Company, decided by the Honorable Walter J. Bristow, May 25, 1977. I need not reach any esoteric questions of statutory construction or legislative intent. Application of the statutory prohibition concerning termination due to the amount of automobile insurance written to the defendant in the present case would patently operate as an unconstitutional impairment of contract the contract was entered into prior to the passage of the act. The bargain struck between the parties provided for termination upon 60 days notice. The subsequent enactment of the statute cannot marry the parties and deprive them of one of the primary rights of the contract. A contract by its very essence involves a, okay, we'll get ready for your test. That's tough. So we have on your test 160, Number one, lit. Let me give you some proper names. You have people of the state of Texas. 
versus Fernando Lopez. You have case number 2007-099. You have Mr. Lopez, Mr. Glack, District Attorney, Janet Shade, Young Hoy, Mr. Hoy, question number two, juror number nine, Mr. Bailiff. Okay, and this is gonna be then your test, 160 lit number one, for five minutes, you all. Good afternoon. We are back on the record in the case of the people of the state of Texas versus Fernando Lopez. This is case number 2007-099. The record will reflect that Mr. Lopez is present with his attorney, Mr. Glack. The people are also present, represented by the district attorney, Janet Shade. The 12 jurors and the one alternate are also present. The court has received the following request from the jury on the official jury question form. The request is as follows. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, submit the following request or question to the court. The request reads as follows. One, we would like a copy of the transcript of Young Hoy's testimony. And two, we would like the testimony of Young Hoy's testimony read out loud to us, the members of the jury. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as to one, let me say this. I know there was reference to prior preliminary hearings where there was testimony from the witnesses, but the court reporter has gone through the testimony of Young Hoy in this case. And there was no reference to any transcript of any prior testimony of Mr. Hoy's. The transcript of any other proceedings is not in evidence at this time. And for that reason, we're not, cannot, and will not be provided to you. Further, as to question number two, the court reporter has located that testimony and has estimated it will take approximately 15 minutes to read it back to you and the attorneys. The attorneys have waived their appearances, so we are going to have the court reporter read it back to you in the jury room. During the time that the court reporter is reading, you are not to deliberate any further. You are not to ask questions, and once she and the bailiff leave the jury room, you may begin your deliberations. At that time, the alternate juror will leave the jury room. Then you may continue with your deliberations. Now, the court has also received a telephone call yesterday from the foreperson. I don't know if that issue was resolved, but if there is a question, it has to be prepared on a form such as this. But I would like now to indicate that you have been provided with all of the applicable law in this case. You have it with you in the jury room and you can review that. We have also provided you with the applicable jury instructions. So the only thing I can do is refer you to the instructions which you have already in the jury room. The jury instructions again are in printed format for your consideration and review. Ladies and gentlemen, I feel that much of what is probably bothering you is part of the jury charge, and that is to apply the facts to the law and reach a decision. So that is a part of the jury's responsibility to determine what the facts are and then apply that to the law to reach a decision in this case. There is nothing further that I can give you in the way of a clarification of the instructions because that is the clarification. When the testimony is read, you do not get a copy of the testimony. The court reporter is going to read from her notes or from her computer screen. I am not sure which is going to happen, but her steno notes have been reduced to the written word. Prior testimony was reduced to writing, but none of that has been entered into evidence. So you are limited to the items that have been entered into evidence. And furthermore, all of the items entered into evidence were provided to you. The words will be read to you, and if there are further questions, you can always ask for additional readback. You heard it when it was provided here in the courtroom, and if there is some disagreement as to what was said, you will be able to hear it again. And if there is further disagreement, you can always ask to 
have it read back. But we will not provide you with any written transcripts of what occurred in the courtroom. You were here. Okay. Now, with that said and done, I will ask that you go back into the jury room with the alternate. The court reporter and the bailiff will join you in the jury room for the readback. Being no further questions, Mr. Bailiff, will you escort the jury back to the jury room? There are no more questions, right? Juror number nine, you look puzzled. Are you sure you have understood everything I have just said? I need to make sure you understood everything I. And then we're going on to your second 160 lift, proper names. You have DA and Mr. Alway. Okay, DA, Mr. Alway. And this is going to be then 160 lift. Number two for five minutes. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the next instruction is that pertaining to reasonable doubt. Now, I am not going to redefine it for you at this time. That is because the judge just gave you a definition. But let me say that reasonable doubt has two parts. The first part is that you are going to determine what the evidence is because you are going to determine what the facts are. You determine the facts from three things, the testimonial evidence, the physical evidence, and the stipulations. So once you determine what the facts are, you are to apply it to the law. The law is what the judge just gave you. So a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, the next time that you have jury service, maybe 25 years from now, when you are thinking back, because as you know, you have got jury service again every year. Well then, you can say, you know, yeah, I did serve on a jury and we came to a verdict. And you will know that you came to the correct verdict because the facts haven't changed at all. You applied the facts as you saw them and that is a lasting thing. Once you determine what the facts are, those are the facts of this case. That is your job. Then you apply the law so that when you look at this case sometime back in the future, you will know that you did the right thing. You did the right thing because you determined what the facts are then you correctly applied the law. Then you came to your decision, okay? Now, that is the first part of reasonable doubt. The second part of reasonable doubt has to do with why we have the 12 of you members of the jury here at all. Now, it is not possible to have 12 neutral individuals at any crime scene at any one time. It just doesn't happen. That is why the standard of proof is beyond a reasonable doubt. Remember that. The standard of proof is beyond a reasonable doubt. It is not beyond all doubt. It is not 10 absolute certainty. It is not beyond a shadow of a doubt. It is beyond a reasonable doubt. There can be some doubt because you weren't there when the crime was committed. Again, there are three sources. If it doesn't come from the witness stand, physical evidence or something that we have stipulated to, you can't consider it at all. So your world is what we gave you already. You might have wanted to hear from other people, but you didn't. You take what we gave you, and if it didn't come from those sources, you can't consider it in this case. That is what your world is. That is what is going to happen here. You determine the facts from what you have been given, and then you apply the law. For instance, say there's a crime called contempt of court. Let's say that the DA in his closing argument can't sit down and play cards. That is a crime. So when I am over there in that chair and I am being prosecuted, the prosecutor calls the first witness. That first witness gets on the stand and she goes and she says, well, the craziest thing happened in court the other day. Mr. Alway, the man over there, came in, 
and in front of the jury, he started playing cards. Well, my attorney and the prosecutor stipulate that I am the prosecutor. And here is the physical evidence. Here are the cards. Now, I just did it in front of the 12 of you. Do you need to go back there to determine whether or not I am guilty? I just did the act in front of you. Okay, yes, the fact of the matter is, yes, you do. Because unless every element is proved beyond a reasonable doubt, it is your duty to acquit. And in this case, this example that I just gave you, there was no information, no testimony regarding the fact that I did it during my closing argument. Okay? Do you understand so far? There is no evidence of that. So even though I did it right in front of you, you would have to acquit me because every element wasn't proved beyond a reasonable doubt. I say beyond a reasonable doubt, okay? Remember again, if it doesn't come from the three sources, you cannot consider it. That is why we presented the evidence that we did. Now, with that in mind, I would like to take you through that evidence. I think the easiest one to go through first is that of the Okay, you all, so that's it. They were very, very good. Good luck. Type them up, see how you're doing. Start off right. Let's make this a great semester and have a great day, okay?